can bring in Scott Lucas, a professor of U.S. and international politics at the University College of Dublin's Clinton Institute. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. First, just what's your overall read on the situation and the probability of it spiraling into a wider war? Well, first of all, the immediate situation to set out what we know, and that is, is that a rocket striking that soccer football field uh, in Israeli-occupied Syrian Golan Heights in Majdal Shams, uh, 12 people between 10 and 20 years old killed. Funerals have just been held. Uh, Israeli ministers who attended the funerals uh, were booed for not providing security for the area, for the Syrian Druze population, and that included the far-right minister, uh, Mr. Smotrich, uh, who has been one who has argued for expanding the war, uh, including against Lebanon. So where are we now? Hezbollah has denied the attack, but in fact, it is quite likely that this was Hezbollah. Uh, just before uh, we heard about the uh, children being killed, Hezbollah had been boasting that it had fired rockets on Israeli military positions in the north of Israel, in the Galilee. So a rocket that went astray is more likely than what Hezbollah is now saying, which is that there was an Israeli interceptor rocket that caused all of this. Uh, will this mean a wider war? That's the huge question right now. From Hezbollah's point of view, I don't think so. I don't think Hezbollah wants to make this a direct war with the Israelis. Uh, it's already lost more than 350 personnel in the skirmishes that have taken place since October. It knows that it is probably outgunned, as it were, by Israel. If uh, Israel was to unleash all of its firepower up there. From the Israeli perspective, I've set up to now that the Israelis don't want a two-front war. They're tied down in Gaza. There's international pressure on them to limit their military, uh, military operations in Gaza, let alone open up a wider war with Hezbollah. But there may be a lot of pressure now on Israeli ministers from part of Israeli society uh, to do something much more aggressive beyond simply, as the Israelis have done this morning, hitting weapons depot and other uh, Hezbollah positions in the east and south of Lebanon. As you said, the Druze community was booing uh, Israeli ministers who were at that funeral. That clearly puts pressure on them to maybe give more of a response. Do we have a sense of, of who people are blaming for this? Uh, would the Druze community blame Hezbollah as well? And could, could that kind of shift popular opinion at all? I mean, the Druze community is caught between uh, Hezbollah and the Israeli occupiers. Uh, they're in a no-win situation where they could get hit by either side. But the fact of the matter is, since 1967, it's Israel that has claimed to provide security for the territory that it occupies in the Golan Heights. Uh, Israel clearly hasn't provided that security against uh, this Hezbollah rocket, if indeed it was a Hezbollah rocket uh, that failed to hit a military target. So I think the Druze community is immediately pointing its anger at the Israelis and saying, look, you know, how do you, you know, protect us? Question is, though, how do you protect us? Do you protect the Druze? by simply ensuring that Israeli air defenses work much more effectively against Hezbollah rockets? Or do you say that you're protecting the Druze by actually going out to, quote, destroy Hezbollah? And what might uh, an Israeli retaliation look like? How, how could they escalate this further? As I said, we've already got the Israeli retaliation to this point in which you go after Hezbollah's weapons depots, uh, you go after other logistical and supply positions, and you might cause some casualties amongst Hezbollah fighters. Uh, but the Israelis have been doing that since October. We also know the Israelis have been carrying out targeted assassinations, effectively, with airstrikes going after Hezbollah senior commanders, and they've killed several of them. Uh, so, you know, they, they have tried to, as it were, decapitate the Hezbollah military leadership. Point is, is that the Israelis have not been able to, quote, eliminate Hezbollah and are unlikely to do so, short of what would be a catastrophic war. So I think we're caught just simply in this ongoing cycle of violence in which civilians will be caught in the crossfire in this case, as opposed to the more than 100 Lebanese civilians which get, who have been killed so far. These happen to be the largest toll of civilians, albeit Syrian Druze civilians, uh, uh, killed by Hezbollah uh, since October the 7th. How does the escalating conflict at the Lebanese border impact the dynamic in the war in Gaza? Well, I, I think let's take this on three levels. I mean, I think the first is for Israel. It raises the question of, look, you know, you've been fighting this war for 10 months in Gaza. You've been expending a lot of military resources there. If you're on the point of a wider war with Hezbollah, do you really want to, to keep rejecting 
or uh, at least stepping away from the possibility of a ceasefire. And we know that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been pushing back against others in the Israeli military and the Israeli community who want that ceasefire. From Hezbollah's perspective and its backer Iran, uh, how do you maintain a lid on this situation? Because the Iranians also don't want Israel to renew attacks, for example, on Iranian commanders in Syria, where several have been killed, or especially attacks on Iran itself. And for the international community, I mean, this is a nightmare scenario. The international community has been almost powerless for 10 months to hold back the Israeli mass killings, follow Hamas's mass killings last October. And now they face the prospect of trying to hold back the Israelis if uh, the Israeli leadership is intent on widening this confrontation with Hezbollah. Yeah, as you say, already a nightmare scenario that hopefully uh, will not escalate even further. Scott Lucas, thank you so much for your analysis. Again, that's Scott Lucas, a professor of U.S. and international politics at the University College of Dublin's Clinton Institute.